John chapter 11, and we'll look at verses 5 through 16. John chapter 11, and we'll be reading verses 5 through 16. In this passage, Jesus is going to a town in Bethany so that he can heal Lazarus, who is dying. But it turned out that Lazarus died, so Jesus Christ had to do the miracle by raising him from the dead. It was during this time of tragedy and hardship and uncertainty, a lot of people didn't know what to do, and they were wondering, Jesus, why won't you go? But there's also some moments where people were wondering, Jesus, why did you go? What I see right here is that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ knew the timing of when to go and when not to go. Yeah, come on. And I believe that's the problem with a lot of people today. Uh, the Bible says at verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent he may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Now, usually the concentration of the sermon from John 11 is the next verses or the entire chapter. However, I want to concentrate only on these verses, on the time of uncertainty, during the time where Jesus Christ was making his own decision and he didn't care what other people thought about it. But at the same time, he did care what other people thought about it. The bottom line is the Lord Jesus Christ, he got it. He knows what to do in this situation. He was in full control. Amen. I mean, there were people saying you shouldn't go to the city because they're going to kill you. And there were other people that told him you should have come earlier. But Jesus Christ, he was not bombarded by the pressure okay. or the situations. And he said, I got this. And he maintained control. Now, you have to understand as a church, we literally survived. Especially if you've been with us the past two years, we literally survived. And the reason why we survived is because we knew what to do. We weren't foolish. We weren't rash. We weren't overzealous and jumped the gun. Then it may have closed. We didn't stay dead either and beat and try to let people tie our hands behind our back. No, we did the call of God and didn't remain dead. Otherwise, the church would have probably been closed. We've made ways to keep going as a church and to keep surviving. The nowadays, Christians are either too dead or overzealous. Okay. And the problem with Christians nowadays is they don't know how to be in the center, how to be balanced. Uh, for example, when we're hymn singing, there could be people who are just plain dead and their heart's not into the singing and they just mumble the words or they just look at it. And then there's another bunch of people who just don't have a care in the world and they go psycho mode and then they just bust a couple windows. So, no, you're not right with God. You're not filled with the Spirit if that happens. We have to understand this, is that as a church... When we're singing to the Lord, there is a balance. Yes. There is a balance. There's times that we shout, that we run, that we get excited, but that at a limited level. And also there is a level where people are just dead and they've got to amp it up a bit. Okay. Here's another example. I mentioned about church closing. I mentioned about uh, singing. 
What about your own Christian walk, which is the most important? Okay. Your own Christian life. In your Christian life, a lot of times you're just dead. And then your heart's not there and you're not alive in the spirit. But then there are those times you get overtly emotional and then you get overzealous. And then when you get overzealous, then uh, you overlook your job, your family, and other things that you're supposed to, which are secular and probably worldly, but that must be performed and done. As Bible-believing Christians, especially when we grow bigger as a church, we have to learn about balance. You'll notice, especially about this year's summer camp, was very different from last year. Did you notice that? Yeah. Why? Because we've gotten bigger. So there has to be more structure. There is no doubt that God's hand is upon our church. And there's no doubt we are going to grow. Right. We are going to grow. As we grow as a Bible-believing church, we cannot forget our beginnings okay. and lose our zeal yeah. and our passion. And at the same time, we should not be out of bounds and cause chaos and ruin the church. Today, I'm going to teach you about that balance that I hope will be helpful to you. And that way, when you sing and shout, that way, when you fellowship, that way, when you preach the gospel publicly on the streets or witness to somebody or anything you do for the Lord, you're at the right balance. And I hope that you will learn that today on the right balance. The title of my message today is, I Got This. All right, let's pray. Now, Father, I'm going to ask for the filling power of your spirit and the cleansing of your blood, because without you I am nothing, and I pray that today's preaching will convict, will enlighten our understanding, and we will run as a church the way it ought to be run for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, my first point is a loving person. A loving person. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5. Now Jesus Christ, he knew how much to go and not to go. Remember, Jesus Christ, he was supposed to heal Lazarus, but he didn't go. He held himself back. He wasn't overzealous and jumped the gun. At the same time, however, he didn't just stay where he was at. He said, now it's time to go. We should go. And the disciples said, don't go there, they're going to kill you. But Jesus didn't care and just went. See, Jesus knew when to help hold himself back and when to push himself forward. Right. I want us to understand that. How did Jesus understand that? How did he got it? And why don't we get it? Because we're flesh. We always go by emotions, how we feel. And that's very dangerous. When you go by feelings, you can either be overzealous or you can be a deadbeat. So you have to not be dictated by how your flesh feels or in the moment. You got to go by scriptural principles in order to do it. Then you'll know when to hold back, when to uh, push forward. Well, what are my scriptural principles? I'm going to give you eight points. And it'll, be, uh, it'll give you the answers that you need. One we can notice from Jesus is that he loved the person. Jesus is a loving person. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Notice that Jesus Christ, he truly loved people. Because he loved Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, that's why he didn't jump the gun. He wasn't overzealous and said, hey, let me do the miracle right now and heal Lazarus. No, because he truly loved them, he said, I'm going to hold myself back. Okay. This is not a time to shout. This is not a time to soul win. This is not a time to rebuke. This is not a time to preach hard. Come on. Why? Because he loved the person. Yeah, yeah. But also, because he loved the person, that's the reason why Jesus Christ later went down to raise Lazarus from yeah. the dead. So he knew when to hold himself back and when to go. Wait, how did he do that by loving them? Because if he truly loved them, he's going to do the miracle by letting Lazarus die and he raised him from yeah. the dead. And that all the people can see it and witness the miracle. And that Lazarus will be one of his best miracles ever. That's how much he loved him. But if he jumped the gun and was overzealous, would have lost that blessing. If he didn't go at all and push himself forward, Lazarus wouldn't have ever gotten that blessing. 
What's my point? If you truly love people, are you thinking about people in this church? Are you thinking about uh, the lost world out there, how your testimony appears? Are you thinking about the Lord most of all? When you think about these things and you know when you can push yourself more and when to hold yourself back. But the problem is, is that you don't think about loving people. Whether we like it or not, a ministry is about people. That's right. Whether you believe it or not. Even false pastors know that. They can't make a living without people. Uh -huh. People are necessary in the ministry because that's who you're preaching at. <clears throat> that's who you're ministering to. That's who you're working for, is for the people. I know that the ministry is about God and you're doing it for the sake of God, but when you're preaching at the pulpit, you're not preaching to Jesus Christ. He don't need to get right with God. You're not, you don't need to encourage Jesus with a motivating sermon. Jesus has all the encouragement that he needs. But you're preaching to people. You're ministering to people. When, when you're uh, setting up meals, you're not preparing meals for God. God don't need your food. You're doing it for the people, though. They need to eat. See, whether you believe it or not, the ministry involves people. And you have to think about people. So before you say something and do something, do something that seems too dead, do something that seems too crazy, think about the people and love the person. What you do by your action might burden the brother and sister in Christ. You know, when I started out the ministry, I love people immensely. I love people immensely. And when I started out the ministry, whether it was one or two people, I didn't care. And because I love the people so much, guess what? Back then, it wasn't uh, running around the bases and throwing hymns. Otherwise, it'd be weird, you know, with just two people and I start doing that. <laughs> right? They think I'm loony then. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Imagine that. You know? Imagine if we had that. You know? Imagine if we had that. I can do it if you want me to. Don't think that I can't do it. I can do it if I want to. All right? But I wasn't a deadbeat either. I wasn't a deadbeat either. I remember that it was like a Korean atmosphere that time in one of my beginnings. So during that time, it had to be very serious, the atmosphere. However, I didn't make it deadbeat. So then I, when I preach and when I teach... I love the people. I want to give them life. Yeah. So what is it to them as a serious thinking people will give them life? Make them seriously think about that book. That'll give them life. Right. That'll give them light. That'll give them motivation. Because Koreans, they're very thinking people. They're listening type of people who think. So then I concentrated that atmosphere. Then we got white people coming in. So then we started shouting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you but you have to, uh, uh, Tom knows what I'm talking about. There's a particular white person who was a big blessing to our church. Yeah, yeah. But he went home to be with the Lord. Anyways, the bottom line is when, I, when you love people, you'll know how to react. Yes, yes. How to act, to respond if you really love people. Listen, if you don't understand people, how can you love them? That's good. There is such a thing where people might go, yeah, I love my brother and sister in Christ, but do you really understand them? That's good. You got to understand the people as well. Otherwise, how can you love them? How can a parent love a child without understanding the child? There's a thing called neglecting parents. And neglecting parents, what they do is that they'll spoil the child. They'll spoil them rotten because they love the child. But in the end, the child actually turns bitter, upset, and feels like that the parent wasn't really there for him or her because the parent didn't really understand the child. It's one thing for, like, there are rich men, for example, who just spoil their children rotten, buy them all the toys they want, buy them the vehicle, buy them the luxury, give them a lot of money, but they're hardly there for them because they don't understand the child. See, you have to understand that if you love people, you need to understand people. You need to understand the audience. Yes. As the church grows bigger, you need to understand the audience. And then you'll know how much more to push, how much more to hold back. Uh, let's look at verse 6. Verse 6. It requires a loving person. The second thing is a lot of patience. Yes, yes. A lot of patience. Verse 6, the Bible says, When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, 
he went down to the same place where he was. Did I read that right? No, it says he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You know, Jesus Christ abode two days. He didn't go down there to heal him. He abode. He stayed where he was at. God is still in control. God wasn't like lingering or like hesitating or, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, I can't wait for this thing to happen. That way I can do it. No, the Lord Jesus Christ was still in control because he was looking at the timetable. Yes, yes. He was still in control because he was looking at the timetable. The easy question to ask yourself before you do something is, can you wait? Okay. Can you wait? You know, people, they can't wait for the next revival meeting. Why? Because they feel spiritually down. Oh, you can't wait? Mm, come on. You mean to tell me that, so that's your go-to card, revival, not your walk with Jesus Christ? Come on, brother. Okay. Jesus, shouldn't he be your all in all? I'm not downing revival, and I'm saying that, sure, revival's a good thing. We put up revivals, but to put your final authority... And all your dependency on revival, you're in hot water and you'll be tr in trouble when persecution happens to this country. And when persecution happens, you're not going to have a revival meeting every day. See, can you wait? If you can't wait, you got an overzealous problem. You got an overzealous problem. You, uh, you can't, you're instantaneous. You have to do something. You know how long it took for me to build this church? It's been 12 years. 12 years. 12 years. After the fifth year, I dropped to two people. But you know what? I, the Lord had to teach me, you can wait. That's good. You can wait longer. Did I ever lose my zeal? I don't think so. You know, unless you hear, see me stop jumping on chairs, then you know that I've calmed down a lot. But you see me doing that here and there. Why? I never lost it. Even during the times when it was slow. That's Why? Good. I can wait. That's good for you. My time to shout will come. My time to hop benches will come. Just not now. I can wait. I can wait. Can you? Can you? People can't wait to just sow in and witness to a person because they're dying and going to hell. And you know, God's been patient for 6,000 years uh, and billions drop into hell. Yes. God's in control. He knows when. Can you? Can you? Sometimes it's not the time to go out witnessing. Sometimes it's the time. You just need to stay at home and be there for your wife and your children. Okay. Amen. There's a lot of patience. You know, deadbeats don't have that either. Not just overzealous people, but dead Christians don't have that either. Dead Christians, they don't have a lot of patience. Why? They can't wait it out until the time comes where they serve the Lord. No, they want to stay the way they are. Because when the time comes to serve the Lord, they can't do it. They're like, no, I don't want to do it. I just want to stay the way that I am. I'm content with my normal way of living. See, that's your problem. You want instant gratification. What you want now. Good. You don't have patience. You don't have patience for the Lord. Your time will come that you have to witness to somebody. You can't just stay the way you are. The time will come that you'll one day preach God's word over here to the people and minister and teach to the people. Your time will come. If you don't want to and you dread it, then you got a problem. There's got to be a push there. Your time will come. And when the time comes, you have to surrender and do it for the Lord. You know why people, uh, na uh, people are overzealous? You know why people are too dead? They don't have patience. Okay. That's their problem. They're not willing to surrender to God's timing. And when God's timing come, I will do it. No, they want to go by their own time table. I want to stay this way or I just want to do something. That's the problem with people nowadays. You know, that prodigal child returning, that lost loved ones of yours getting saved, it takes a lot of patience. Yeah, good, brother. You know what San Francisco, Berkeley, San Jose, Santa Clara needed? Patience. A lot of patience. You don't get ground like this, fruit like this. It takes patience. And bless God, I don't care how long it's going to take. I'm just going to be very stubborn. 
drag myself to church, even if there's two people, and then make sure that I don't lose the joy of the Lord, and I'm going to keep on going for Jesus Christ. I can keep on going. I can wait it out. I can keep on going. You want to... You want to stay stubborn for 10 years, San Francisco Bay Area? Guess what? I'm going to be more stubborn than you. Yes. Yes. That's good. Amen. Takes a lot of patience. Yes. Then you know when to push and when to hold back. Right. I have a lot of visions and plans and goals, and some of you have heard that recently too. But this took years. And some of the plans that I have takes time. It takes time. People have asked about our church directory. When are you going to update it? When are you going to update it? I couldn't update it until one and a half year later. When it's so simple to update it. But why couldn't I? I had to set my priorities straight. That's why. I was going through COVID restrictions. People were hurting all over. I had to help that out. I can wait. I can wait. A lot of patience. Verse 7 through 8. A lion-hearted push. A lion-hearted push. Verse 7 through 8. Then after that he saith to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Notice right here, Jesus did not fear the people, even though the disciples did. So he had a lion heart moment in him, and he said, Hey, let's go. And then he, he gave that push that the people need. Hey, let's go over there. Well, they're going to stone you to death if you go out in the streets and preach. That's okay. Let's just go out street preaching. Let's do it. Do you have that? If you don't fear the people, you're going to have that in you. The problem nowadays why Christians are too held back that it turns into laid back and they become laid back Christians, then they become dead Christians, is because uh, they refuse to push. They don't have that lion heart moment. Well, am I too dead, Pastor? I know when you're too dead if you never had a lion hearted moment. You probably never had a lion hearted moment because you just thought about the people. You're afraid of them. You're afraid what the people thought. No, you don't care about what people think. What do people think about Gene Kim? I don't care what they think. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I don't care what people think. Or am I going to go, well, because this is the Bay Area. I have to minister to those people's needs. Street preaching will make me lose my testimony and they'll think I'm a wacko. So I'm not going to go street preaching. Yeah, some Bible-believing pastors are like that. You'd be surprised. It's a shame nowadays. I'm not going to do street preaching and I'm going to be laid back and I'm going to blend in. You know, those charismatics, those Calvinists, what they're doing, you know, having a little coffee table sessions with them. Yeah. I think I'm going to do that, you know, uh -huh. meet at their level. And, you know, and that's why those churches are so deadbeat. And then when you go to those churches, they have no life in them. And 90% of their members are carnal members. You know why? Because that's how you minister to them with carnal. Right. That's your problem. You know what I do? No, I don't care what people think. I'm going to preach the gospel out on the street. That's why I'm not dead. When I'm waiting on the Lord for the timetable and patient with people, I never lose my push moment. When God opens that door and say, you take it, you know what you better do? You better run and take that door. But when he opens that door, how many missed opportunities have you bailed out on God because you were such a deadbeat Christian? I know when you're deadbeat. I know when you hold yourself back too much. It's when God opens that door and you don't take it because you fear the people. I thought we're supposed to fear God, not people. There's supposed to be a lion-hearted push. I know what they say about me in this area and online. I know. And guess what? Make those video scoffing me, you're going to keep seeing this lion push on and I'll keep preaching against your sin and kicking your wrong doctrine. Sorry. So, you, yeah, and I'm not sorry. You're right, brother. I'm actually not sorry. But see, I'm going to keep pushing on because I don't fear the people. Well, they happen, you know, even if they, you know what's going to happen? Let's say I lose this church again, I drop to two people. 
You know what's going to happen? You're going to see me keeping, keep on going and pushing. And yeah, if I start from scratch and being patient and loving with people, guess what? I'm going to do it. Why? Because I'm a lion at heart and I'm going to roar and push on. What about you? What about you? That's when you know that you don't have it in you when you're dead. You don't have a lion-hearted moment. Why didn't you give out that trap? Because of how people will think of you? Why didn't you witness to that soul? Because you're afraid of what so-and-so is going to look at you as? Why don't you shout? Why don't you sing? Why don't you march? Oh, because it's not me? Maybe you need a lion-hearted moment. I'm not saying that everybody should jump benches, and you're not right with God if you don't jump benches, but my point is, you ever looked at your life and say, you know, I wondered if I ever took a bold stand for Jesus ever. And it doesn't have to be shouting. Did you ever take in a bold stand for Jesus and just didn't fear the people? That's my bottom line. That's good. And maybe that's why sometimes you have to act a little crazy. That way you can know when to be a little bit more of a lion once in a while. <laughs> maybe you need to act crazy once in a while. Yeah, maybe you need to preach the gospel on the street once. Yeah, maybe you need to shout amen once. Yeah, maybe you need to jog around the room once. Why? You could use the exercise. <laughs> Verse 9 through 10. Verse 9 through 10. A lighted path. A lighted path. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. You know why our Lord got this? It's because... When he was going down to heal Lazarus at the right timing, he was thinking about a lighted path. Men are stumbling in darkness and they need the light. Right. You know why you need to hold yourself back? Because you're the only light in this dark world. Right. And that's why there are times you need to hold yourself back so that you can shine a little longer. Okay. Why can't I uh, be like some of these other pastors, you know? And why is it that the Calvinists have to be the one getting media publicity in taking a stand against the government? You know, I want to do that too. I want to go up, go up against the counties, take the stand for Jesus Christ. But why can't I do that? Because I'm not a millionaire like Johnny Boy MacArthur. I'm not like I'm not like uh, I'm not like MacArthur with all that money and power. And if I'm going to be a light in this dark community, guess what? I'm going to. Do my best in surviving and hold myself back. Yeah, yeah. And then I, that way I can rot here a little longer and be a thorn on their sides a little longer. Right. Passing out tracts. Re reaching nearly 2,000 homes during a time when it was at its hardest, if you remember that. Do you remember that time? Amen. And we did it the wisest way, the right way, and we ministered to almost 2,000 people. Can you imagine how many liberals are mad with those chick tracks we passed out? <laughs> they, ar they address the riots. They address the global warming issue and yeah. stuff like that. And we did it. We are the ones that did it. Why? We held ourselves back to be a light to minister in that way. That's why you need to hold yourself back because you need to be a light that survives longer and shine in this dark world. Yeah, you need to go forward and have guts and make a bold stand for Jesus and push yourself. You might say, why? Because you're that bright, shining light in the darkness. What's going to pierce the darkness if not you? Are you going to hide your light and sing this little light of mine? I'm going to hide it under a bush bushel. Yes! I'm going to not let it shine. Is that what you're going to do? No, you need to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I am a real Bible believer. King James only. Dispensational. Yeah, you're going to burn in hell if you don't repent and receive Jesus Christ for your salvation. Yeah, I yelled it out on the street corner, so just shoot me, sue me. What? You need to be a shining light. That's why you need to be more bold. You need to go more forward. Yeah, you need a little bit more zeal. Why? You held off your light too long and you, you become the darkness just like them. And we can't tell the difference with you and a lost person anymore. 
You seem to be the same like them. Why? You're just as dark as them. We don't see a light shining. How do I know when to hold myself back? Simple. Is your light going to keep on shining in the dark? How do I know that I need to go forward and need to be more zealous? Simple. Is your light piercing the darkness? See, the lighted path. That's what you need to see. My fifth point is a little perception. A little perception. Uh, look at verse 11 through 13. If there's one thing we know about people is that people nowadays are so foolish, especially the past two years. Can we get an amen on that? Can we get an amen on how ridiculous people are, you know? Protection! And then they still, uh, uh, I got it. Protection twice, thrice. Oh, I still caught it compared to the person who didn't have one. Why the way, we live in an insane asylum nowadays. This is peace and love. Breaking down windows, killing cops. That's peace and love. Insane asylum. We are living in an insane asylum nowadays. Can you agree with me that people nowadays, they hardly have perception? That's what you need to understand. How you know you need to be more zealous or you need to hold yourself back is you need to realize people have only a little bit of perception. And they're going to remember you by what they're impressed with the most about you or what they know about you. And you want that to last. Now, uh, look at this. Verse 11 through 13. The Bible says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Man, I fully understand, Lord. You're going to resurrect him from the dead, and uh, he's dead. No. Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Little perception, these disciples. When Jesus says something, little perception. You, know, you, you want an example? Here's an example. You're wicked. Because you're a sinner, you're going to burn in hell. You know how the disciples, the world understands that? He says he hates me and he wants to kill me. That's the world. That's people. They have a little perception. When you're yelling out on the street, you know what they're seeing? He's so angry. He hates us. He's calling me names. No, you're the one calling me names. <laughs> we never called you a name at all. You know why? Little perception people have. So verse 13, how be it Jesus spake of his death. But they thought, see, little perception, that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. You have to understand the kind of world that you're in. Okay. When you realize what world and what people you're ministering to, they're going to have a little perception of you. Think about this. If they have a little perception of you, how should you talk? How should you act then where you want it to last in their mind? Remember, they're going to misunderstand you. No matter how nice, there's one thing you need to learn. No matter how nice you are as a Christian, they will still misunderstand you. So here's what you want to do. Whether I'm too mean or too nice, it doesn't matter. Either or it's not right or wrong. The point is, whether I'm too mean or too nice, how do I want them to misunderstand me that will last? Okay. You know what they know me as? They know me one thing, online especially, if there's one thing they know about me is, I hate Calvinism. <laughs> These Calvinists say, oh, he's like, he hates everything. You know, he kicks John MacArthur, he kicks everybody. Well, there's one thing they know, I hate Calvinism. And when you walk in this door, there's one thing you're going to know, I hate Calvinism. And yeah, they're going to misunderstand about he's hateful, he's mean, he's too sarcastic. What an arrogant guy. Well, at least they carry the notion they know that I hate Calvinism. And they know that I believe in free will. And I believe in a God who gives a free choice to everybody. And he loves them enough that he doesn't bend or twist their arm to go to heaven or to burn in hell. Amen. At least I'm an honest Christian, not a dishonest Calvinist. At least I'm honest about that. That's the kind of God that I believe in who gives free choice. They're going to know that about me. If there's one thing that the people in the streets know about me is that I'm going to burn in hell if I don't receive Jesus Christ. Good. Yeah. You know how to get saved now. 
You keep saying A, B, and C, and if you're a sinner, believe on Jesus Christ, and then confess, and if I don't do that, I'm going to burn in hell. Good. What, what very little perception they have of me, at least that's going to last in their minds. And at the great white throne judgment, God's going to point that out to them. Yeah. You know what the misunderstanding that I get from the world? This guy, he, he's so arrogant. He thinks he's a real Bible believer. Who does he think he is? And, well, at least they know that I'm a Bible believer. Yeah, yeah. yeah they know. And I'm going to be try to be as real about it. Yeah. They know that. Call me arrogant, whatever, but at least they're not going to call me Lutheran. <laughs> they're not gonna even call me, they're not gonna even call me independent fundamental Baptist. They're not gonna call me sword of the Lord. They're not gonna call me any of these stuff. They're gonna call me Bible believer. But at least they know that. So the thing is, they're gonna have very little perception. So in your zeal or in your Hold back moment, how do you want them to remember you by? That's good, brother. That's good preaching. Then you know how much you should push and how much you should hold back. That's good. Because remember, these are people who have very little perception. Yeah. That's good. So what very little attention span that they have, because we're in a TV, internet, social media generation where the attention span is only 10 seconds of TikTok, and that's all that they're going to click on. You need to make sure that it's going to be something that will last that they'll remember in that little perception. That's good. Amen. Because they're not, going to, they're not going to get all the details from you. They're going to misunderstand you. No matter how well you deliver it, no matter how great your testimony is, they will still misunderstand you. Remember that. That's the kind of wicked, evil world we live in nowadays. So then you want to make sure that whatever they're going to misunderstand you on, they're going to remember you by. That little perception is going to be a good thing. The fruit that you want, the result that you want, that they're going to remember you by. That's good, preacher. Uh, let's look at verse 14. A level of plainness. A level of plainness. There's got to be some level of plainness for people. Because remember, they have little perception. They're wicked people. They're a dumb generation, IQ level, uh, just 10% of the battery of their iPhones. That's what it is. Look at verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus Christ, he knows he has to go down there with his disciples. So in order to do that, he's got to explain to them plainly, hey, Lazarus is dead. That's what I meant. That's why I need to go down there and take care of the matter. Do you have a level of plainness? If there's one thing, I could be wrong, and some of you, if this was not you, you can let me know, but a lot of the other people that I talk to, if there's one thing why you ended up in our church or the people watched me online is because when I teach it, I teach it clear. Yeah, amen. I don't talk Greek, Hebrew, Rabbi Zacharias, apologetics, blah, 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 blah. I just tell you plainly, okay? If you're stupid, I'm going to say you're stupid and not be afraid about that and hurt, I hurt other people's feelings. No, if you're stupid, you're stupid, okay? And then if I say that I love you in the Lord, I'm not going to be ashamed and go, oh, that's too queasy. No, I love you in the Lord, all right? So I'm going to make it plain to you. I'm going to make it plain for you to understand. So plain, I'll draw it out for you if I have to. I'll draw it out if I have to, okay? I'm going to give you a level of plainness. I'm not going to say that, well, if you are an unbeliever who is not familiar with the salvation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then there is a separation from His holiness where you cannot experience or feel the love of Jesus. No, no, I'm just going to tell you this. If you're lost, you're going to burn in hell. Okay? I'm just going to tell you plainly. Okay? That's it. That's it. Uh, you got to realize, you got to, you live in a generation Man, that's good where it's such little perception, you have to make a plain for them. Yeah. Come on. Man. So, when you're street preaching, see, they have little perception of you. Are you going to make it plain for them to understand or they're going to just see you as a hateful bigot? If your purpose was for them to get saved, make it plain that way they can see, oh, his purpose for doing that is so that we can get saved. Yeah, yeah. Not to get us angry. 
You know, uh, you know why you need to hold yourself back? Sometimes people misunderstand. You need to make a plane so they don't misunderstand. Yes. You know why you need to be bold and shout out, I love Jesus, rather than holding back? You know why you need to do that? Simple, because people don't know if you really love Jesus. Yes. And they're ashamed of Jesus. And then you need to say, hey, I love Jesus, and I'm not ashamed about it. Amen. You need to make a plane for them to see, oh, this guy's a Christian. You know how much you should hold yourself back and how much you should push yourself forward? If you realize that there must be a level of plainness that they understand you by. Make it clear. Or is it very plain and clear to them that you're crazy? That you're a nut job? That uh, you're hateful? Or is it plain to them that you're a dead Christian? And that you're cold and you're no different from them how they act? Is this helping you understand a bit more on how you can control more, how you can be balanced more in your zeal and also in pushing forward? Uh, the seventh point, verse 15, verse 15, a lasting purpose, a lasting purpose. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent, he had an intention, a purpose, ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. See, Jesus Christ, the reason why he didn't go down immediately to heal Lazarus, because he had a purpose that he wanted to last. I'm glad I didn't go down there to heal Lazarus. Why? So that later on when I raise him from the dead, you can believe. You know why you need to hold yourself back? You need to have a purpose that will last and not just die out just because of an instantaneous feeling. That is good right there, right there. You know, that's your problem nowadays is that the reason why you just do the soul winning, the witnessing, or you just do the shouting and then the praising and stuff like that is because an instantaneous feeling. And then come Monday, you lose your joy of the Lord. Okay. Wow. Okay. But, uh, you know, when we, when I'm, what about the money spent? The people, how their spiritual level is at? Yeah. The preachers that I know about. When I concentrate on these things, that revival shouting and praising can keep going on. That's right. It's a lasting purpose. That's See, when you're doing stuff, you have to think about, will it last? Will it last? Or is it just a dying flame that just burns out? That's why you need to hold yourself back. Because you need to think about not just the moment, but the overall oh. The overall on what's going to last for years. That's, good. That's why you need to hold yourself back. That's why you need to push forward and you need to have more zeal. You know why? Keep going down the road that you're doing without zeal for the Lord. Ain't going to last. You're going to get deader and deader and deader. You need to push forward. You know why I'm not going to uh, compromise and drop visitation street preaching? I'll tell you why. Because I want this to last. I know when I drop it, it's going to drop more. Verse 16, verse 16. So the point is, do they see the glory of God from, from your action? When you shout, when you sow in, when you hold yourself back, when you just sit down in church and just be quiet, is it done for the glory of God? Will the glory of God be manifested overall? with my controversial titles on, on the internet that are so wild and big. Is this something done for the glory of God that's going to last for a long time? And at times when I don't put in a controversial title and when I'm gone from the internet for a couple of weeks, is it done because of attention for the glory of God where I can keep this church going for a lasting purpose? And maybe that's why I took a break from the internet during that week. See, the point is, you have to think about the glory of God. Then you know why you have to push forward when you have to hold yourself back and you can't do it. Uh, the eighth point is a leading pattern, a leading pattern. Let's look at verse 16, verse 16. It's because people are going to follow your pattern, you're going to lead them. And guess what? There's one thing you know about people, especially children. Listen up. Especially children, they do it more in excess. Uh, verse 16 says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, 
Let us also go that we may die with him. Okay, so Jesus said, I'm going to go down there and I don't care what people think. Thomas, he's following Jesus' pattern. All right, let's go with Jesus. But then he took it excessively. So we're all going to die with Jesus Christ. Get ready to be burned at the stake for Jesus. And Jesus is like thinking, I never thought of that. You know, but I never said that. You know what the point is? People follow your example. Whatever you do for the Lord, they're going to do it excessively. Okay. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? That's why there is no Dr. Peter S. Ruckman alive today. You might say, why? If he's alive today, but the way he talks, and then uh, our next generation comes and then start talking like him, and they do it even more in excess. Yeah. Ruckman does it with an intention, with the purpose. Wow. Wow. Other people, they don't think like that. Whoa. They just say, well, he talks like that. I'll talk like that too. Yeah, and what's going to happen? Then, then you get arrested, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I believe the Lord took him home at the right time. This is definitely not his time. He's, he's too good for this wicked world. It's a totally new generation culture and age we live in that you and I have to live and fight against. But the point is this, is that people follow in excess. Look how you sing and shout and run, especially the children. They're going to see that and want to do it even more excessively. See how you preach the gospel on the street and witness to people. Kids will see that and they will do it excessively. Here is hard. Here's something hard for me. When I preach on this pulpit, there will be people who take my place in this pulpit and preach excessively. Right. When I teach a big, deep doctrine, there will be people who will do it excessively. See, you have to think about that. Right. Look, I'm not telling yourself, you know, that uh, you just, uh, you're overzealous. But what I'm saying is, uh, I keep doing the things that I'm doing for the Lord. I don't care if people think that it's out of bounds. If I believe it's right, I'm going to do it for the Lord. But I have to realize that there's going to be a price to pay. Right. There's going to be those excess moments when people follow my example. So how am I going to help them out to balance them? Yeah. Good, See that? Amen. See that? It's the same thing with uh, not being overzealous. It's just being, you know, just doing nothing. No zeal whatsoever. You're too hold, held back that you're too laid back. Guess what? The children will follow your example. Right. If you sing like this, children are going to do it excessively. They're just going to go... Yep. Yep. If you can't witness to somebody... And tell them about how to get saved. If you don't have the guts to preach out loud on the street. Children do much worse. They'll do this. Yeah. They're going to do excessively. What's my point? My point is when you hold yourself back. And when you push forward. How will people follow your example? And remember they will do it excessively. There's one thing to think about from this passage. You know, if Jesus didn't hold himself back by, by abiding a couple days and just went down immediately to heal Lazarus, he wouldn't have magnified the glory of God that he can raise a dead person to life if Jesus didn't hold himself back. That's right. Another thing, if Jesus didn't push himself forward, and the disciples said, why are you going down there? They're going to kill you. If Jesus didn't push forward and said, I don't care, let's go. God still wouldn't get the glory. Yeah. Lazarus would have remained dead. What's my point? The point is God don't get glory either way. If Jesus didn't hold himself back the right way, didn't push himself forward the right way. You know why this sermon is very important? The way you act and do things, whether overzealous or dead, the point is this. It won't bring glory to God. You can scream your lungs out all you want and do cartwheels for Jesus Christ for him. But you know what? If it's not right, it won't bring glory to God. And you just wasted your energy. That's what you did. If you're too dead in your church and you just come to church and you go, 
well, you know what, uh, I, I don't have to really, uh, as long as I just come to church, you know, I don't have to like really show my enthusiasm for the Lord and motivation for, as long as I, you know, just come, then that's okay. If you keep doing it that way and that's not right, all your church attendance doesn't bring glory to the Lord, no matter how serious you are. What's my point? Whether you're too laid back or you're too pushy, the thing is, it doesn't bring glory to the Lord either way. You have to think about when you hold yourself back and when you push yourself forward, will it bring glory to the Lord? Am I following the scriptural principles? If you do that, you will glorify God beyond all else. When I, uh, the way that I handled this government, even though it just seemed too laid back, Guess what? It brought glory to the Lord. I know that. How I uh, address this community, it may have seemed too pushy, even online too mean or controversial, but I know it brought glory to my Lord. Right. See, the point is this, is that I know that when I held myself back, it was done to glorify God overall in our ministry. And when I pushed myself forward, didn't care what people thought about, I know it brought my Lord glory. Self-control is the answer. That's the bottom line. Self-control is the bottom line. Are you able to control yourself where you can go on and off with the switch? Or when you switch off, it's too hard to push it back on. You just want to stay off. Or when you push it on, there's no turning back. You just want to keep going on, 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 on. See, the problem is you don't have good self-control. You can switch it on and off. You can be flexible. If you do that, then you can get your incorruptible crown because it depends upon temperance, okay. your self-control. You got this or you don't. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. I think as a church, we need to reflect our actions more on how we use our zeal or how we use our coolness. We need to really examine ourselves and see, am I in the right balance? If you're not sure, then it's good to look at these scriptural principles. You need to look at them. Do you really love people? Do you really love people? Do you understand people? If you understand people, you love them. And you'll know how much to push it a bit more and how much to hold back. Can you wait? Oh, if you can't wait, and you can't do it at the timing when God says to go, then you're in the wrong. You know that your actions are wrong. Can you push yourself, no matter what people think or see you as? Are you afraid of them? Or do you have the boldness in you? I don't care, I'm just gonna do it for the Lord. If you never had that moment in your life you're too laid back. Do you think about the people dying in darkness and how your light will shine? Will it survive? Will it keep shining bright and even brighter and brighter? If you think about that, you'll know those moments when to hold yourself back and when to push a little forward. Do you realize people have very little perception nowadays and they're, ju they're just wicked? They're foolish. They will misunderstand you. So whatever they perceive you as, it's going to make a lasting impression. You want to make sure that you give them that right impression that you want them to know you by. Because they have very little perception of you. Do you have a level of plainness? Because people misunderstand you, you need to make it plain, clear to them. Don't make them... Don't make them see your wrong testimony. You want to show them why you're doing that for the Lord. Make them understand it. It's not done for something wrong. People are foolish nowadays, so you need to make it plain for them so they can clearly see and understand. Your witnessing will change so much if you realize that. The way you handle a church will change so much after that. The way you fellowship with other people around you will transform after that. Do you have a lasting purpose? Do they see the glory of God from your action? 
If you hold yourself back, there's nothing wrong. If it glorifies the Lord. If it lasts. There's nothing wrong with uh, pushing yourself forward, making yourself look like an idiot for Jesus. If it glorifies the Lord. If it lasts. You got to think about how does God see it. One of the most important things is how you lead. How you leave a pattern behind. People tend to do things excessively. So you have to look at the way you, you act. You, you talk. You move. You fellowship. You preach. You teach. You witness. You praise. Whatever you do, you have to see how you're going to lead by example. And what you want them to follow. The good and not the bad. The whole bottom line to this sermon is self-control can you control yourself can you switch that on button when you need to go on can you switch it off when you need to go off people can't do that you need to be flexible you can switch on when you need to be on off when it needs to be off can you control yourself control yourself to go and control yourself to hold back our Savior got this. I wonder if you do today. I got this. I got it. I know what to do. Do you have that in your mind before you do something? A lot of times there's no self-control before we do something. A lot of times we just do it, right? That's our problem. We just do it. Either being dead or being overzealous. We just do it. We just go with the flow. And that's dangerous. No, you have to think. You have to self-reflect. You have to see, am I in control here? Am I doing this right? That will make a whole world of difference. Let's close with a word of prayer. Now, Father, we thank you so much for your word that can uh, teach us how to live our lives. It's hard to live as a balanced Christian at times. And I know how difficult it can be. It took me years for you to teach me through pastoring a ministry and to <laughs> uh, interact with people. If they knew Gene Kim uh, 15 years ago, they would have seen a very weird person, a strange person who couldn't even survive in life. Whether I'm saved or lost, even if I'm backslidden, I couldn't survive <laughs> uh, my own ways. Uh, Father, you changed my life so much, and I pray that these biblical principles that you taught me will save them from a lot of heartache and pain that they're going to go through in the future, and it'll help them to live life as a balanced Christian, knowing how much to go and how much to hold back. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.